Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I was asked to say, give you a little bit of a kind of bio, my story, which I'm happy to do. I'm still kind of a Pentecostal at heart, so we're always happy to give our testimony. Uh, one theologian once commented that testimony is the poetry of Pentecostal experience, which I think is lovely. Um, my grandfather was born. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, um, I, uh, I don't know where you want to start. I, I guess I, I, I do need to say this. So I wasn't raised in the church. I uh, became a Christian day after my 18th birthday. It was actually just 25 years ago this month. Uh, I, so I was recently reflecting on this. So I had one of those sort of cataclysmic conversion experiences, not because like I was a horrible frat boy, but just because it changed everything for me. And um, not that all frat boys are horrible, by the way, but just the majority. Um, uh, so I was, um, I, I, I'll tell you the story only because it's sort of ecumenical. Uh, I was converted through the Plymouth Brethren. How many have ever heard of the Plymouth Brethren? The, our claim, the claim, of, claim to fame of the Plymouth Brethren is basically they invented dispensationalism, all right? Um, so I went to, this is all I knew of Christianity, so I felt called to ministry. So I went to the one Plymouth Brethren Bible College, which is called Emmaus Bible College in Dubuque, Iowa. Studied there. All my profs were Dallas Seminary uh, uh, graduates. Um, while I was there, discovered reformed theology of the old Princeton variety. Do you know what I mean? B.B. Warfield, Charles Hodge, A.A. Hodge, J. Gresham Machen, folks like that. Lights went on for me. Uh, at the same time, I discovered philosophy. Started reading Francis Schaeffer and Alvin Plantinga. So, um, and at this time, I also started to struggle with Am I called to be a pastor or am I called to be a, I didn't know what, some kind of Christian scholar, academic, theologian, philosopher. So I wrestled with that for several years while finishing my undergraduate degree, while doing a master's degree. Finally, uh, through a process of discernment, decided that this intellectual track was one I could pursue and should pursue because it felt like you could always still be involved in ministry in ways. Whereas if I just went the ministry track, it was going to be very hard to come back to the academic vocation. Um, that turned out to be, I think, the right decision. Every once in a while, I'm haunted by the sense that maybe I should be in pastoral ministry until like I see pastors with like beepers on or what, you know, it's like you're on call constantly. It's like, no, I could do without that. Um, so I did my PhD. I ended up, the other decision I had to make was, and this is why I'm interested in your integration conversations, because I feel like I've always been spanning disciplines uh, and moving back and forth between disciplines. When I, I was telling somebody this morning, when I applied to PhD programs, I applied to a theology program, a religious studies program, and a philosophy program. So you could tell I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, but I actually applied to people, right? So there was a person at this program, a person at this program, and a person at this program. I ended up doing my PhD in philosophy, in a philosophy department at Villanova. But in God's providence, this was actually really a beautiful gift. It was a philosophy department at an Augustinian Catholic university. So it was a Catholic university in the Augustinian order. And the theology department had an incredible patristics program with, you guessed it, a real strength in St. Augustine. So one of the things they let me do in my PhD program was forge an interdisciplinary degree a little bit. My degree was in philosophy, but they let me take grad courses in theology, and I had a theologian on my committee. So, uh, and that was a real gift, because the way philosophers learn Augustine is a bit reductionistic, right? Philosophers tend to read Book 11 on Time in the Confessions, the free choice of the will, um, maybe book 12 of the city of God, and they think they know Augustine, right? Um, whereas patristic scholars are like, don't tell me you know Augustine if you've never read the letters and never read the sermons, uh, which is actually really crucial. So all that to say, sorry if I'm rambling. Um, for me, in a way, my, my own vocational formation was always inhabiting multiple disciplines at the same time, and yet... When you come out of a PhD program and you're trying to get a job, somebody is going to ask you, can you teach 101 in X? There are no 101 
interdisciplinary courses, <laughs> right? So when you emerge from a graduate program and you want to then land a vocation in an academic post, you have to have a specialty. And that means you have to be accountable to the standards and rigor of a discipline. And I think part of the challenge I've always been trying to negotiate is how do you both do your homework and earn your cred within a discipline without letting that becoming a way of being blinded to other ways of pursuing truth. Uh, and, and realize that there are different st standards and criteria that are operative in other disciplines. And to be interdisciplinary is actually to learn how to negotiate those different uh, pieces. Um, when I was finished my grad program, the last thing I wanted to do was teach at a Christian college because I thought Big Brother would be looking over my shoulder constantly, and for some reason, as a 28-year-old, that just seemed like the worst thing in the world. Um, so I taught at Loyola Marymount University, which is a Jesuit university in Los Angeles. Very interesting experience, because it turned out those students didn't give a rip about the things that I cared about. <laughs> my best student that I can remember from teaching there for three years was a guy named Bill Van Otterloo, who was Dutch Reformed. Uh, so I started saying, hey, this maybe isn't the right institutional context for me. And so when Calvin College called me uh, 11, 12 years ago, um, that was like homecoming in a sense. It was also probably the best Christian philosophy department in the country, so it was a great place to land. So that said, my, it, the funny thing that happens to me is um, when I go out and speak, sometimes I get introduced as a theologian. And actually a lot of people who read my stuff think I'm a theologian. In my department, the worst thing you can be is a theologian. <laughs> if they call you a theologian, it's not a compliment. <laughs> so my, my um, and I think that's bad, I mean, I think they should stop doing that, but uh, um, my work has always sort of been philosophy in the service of theology and increasingly in the service of the church. So negotiating those different pieces, and that's part of what, I guess maybe that story is not irrelevant to asking the question I want to put on the table today, which is why should we think about going beyond integration talk? So let me lay out just a few prompts that I hope will turn into a conversation. Let's, the first question I want to ask is, well, why beyond integration? Shouldn't we like, shouldn't we be after integration? That seems like a good thing. Uh, I want to contextualize this by saying, when I ask about going beyond integration, it actually assumes all the good things that characterize good integration. So I'm not trying to be dismissive. But I would say this. I think there are two limitations of integration talk. First of all, integration tends to be a spatial metaphor. Right? So think about it. We're always using metaphors. And what we're trying to talk about is how to put together either well, think of two things. We're either talking about how to put together faith and scholarship, that's one kind of integration, or we're trying to talk about how to put together different disciplines. Does that make sense? If you use the metaphor of integration, it tends to function spatially so that you end up combining or thinking about how you can combine two different domains. Right? So if you say, how can we integrate faith and learning, <coughs> you end up effectively thinking in terms of, well, this is the domain of faith, and this is the domain of learning or scholarship. Wow. Seriously. <laughs> uh, um. <laughs> And, and integration is, of course, looking for the ways that we can get these, ideally, to overlap more and more. But there's something about this sort of domain picture that I think itself is already a problem. So to, to immediately start talking about integration is, to, in a way, to cede something to this imaginative metaphor that treats these things as discrete domains, and now we're trying to figure out how to get them to overlap. The same thing, you could put disciplines up there and it works the same way. Um, I, th I think that's the limit. That's one of the limits of the integration metaphor. I think the goal 
that's intended in that conversation about integration is exactly right. I just wonder if the limits of the metaphor make it impossible to achieve the goal that we're after. So that's part of what makes me wonder whether we might think about going beyond in, uh, um, integration and instead think of it differently. Here's why. I think some of the more significant tensions we feel. You're all doctoral students, is that right? Yeah. So I think, uh, um, or fa and faculty, some faculty. Um, I think some of the deepest tensions and challenges that are felt at the level of scholarship have to do less with this sort of discrete domain problem and more with very different orientations or aims that characterize the guild versus the church. So uh, um, I, uh, the way I've seen struggles in uh, um, integrating, I'm going to use the language, right, faith and scholarship, often are instead struggles of how to carry out my discipline in ways that conform to the expectations and orientation of the guild versus the interests and orientations and goals I have as a confessional Christian scholar. So instead of thinking of it spatially um, in terms of integration, I wonder if we could think about this in terms of orientation or alignment because now now what the, the tension is so here's the work of a discipline but now the question is how the how of carrying out the work of that discipline when the guild the regnant guild in that discipline sees the end or telos, or goal of this practice here, whereas communally, the church, or as Christians, we might see a very different end, or goal, or telos that we're after. Um, it's asking the what for question. Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, there's something about trying to think of this in terms of aligning orientations teleologically, right? It's, it's what are we after? What's the end? What's the target? So I only suggest that we need to get beyond integration in order to achieve a new kind of integrity between faith and scholarship and between the multiple disciplines that serve theological reflection. So instead of a rather static spatial picture are there ways that we could think of a more dynamic teleological picture that is oriented towards a telos? Perhaps we could speak of alignment then or integral orientation. Here the questions are different. Um, what are we here for? What's the telos? Or here's another way you can frame this. What sort of person do we want to graduate? What sort of scholars do we want to be? What sort of alumni does Trinity want emerging from its doctoral programs? That's, that's asking the question a little bit differently. To what end are we scholars? Um, now, I'll flag this before I say one more thing. Um, I'm worried that the way I'm talking could make it sound like I think you could just excuse yourself from the rigors of the guild. And that's not what I'm talking about. But the question is, are there ways that we can both observe and meet the rigors of the guild while at the same time demurring from what they think is ultimate? Right? So this, none of this can turn into an excuse for you to just be a really shoddy scholar. Say, well, no, I, I, 
look, I, I, um, this peer review process is expecting me to do X, Y, and Z, but I'm not going to do that because I'm just following Jesus in the academy. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's a dodge. That's a punt. The question is, what does it look like for you to be able to earn your stripes according to the rigors of the relevant guild and at the same time learn how to refuse to get co-opted by what the guild thinks is ultimate? Uh, that's hard to do. One of the reasons it's so hard to do, it wouldn't characterize, obviously, an education at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, but for those of us who went into graduate programs in secular or mainstream contexts, graduate school is a novitiate. Do you know what I mean? It is an induction into a way of life. And you absorb a teleological orientation to something that is ultimate without realizing. So, this is also why I think integration is not just intellectual. We need to be attentive as scholars to the formations of our loves, to the formations of our imaginations. It's a holistic project. And that, that's why I think congregational life is, in a sense, a site of faculty development and scholarly formation. There is no way that you become the kind of Christian scholar who undertakes this academic work to the end of glorifying God and building up his kingdom and renewing creation if you are not concurrently being formed by the practices of the Christian community that habituate your loves in that way. So this is, uh, uh, um, um, you know, very concretely, when I was in grad school, um, uh, part of it is realizing that I don't care how smart you are in the doctoral program here, there is a plumber at church who is way wiser than you are. Okay, so there, there has to be a posture of humility that, that the church's academics take in the way that we inhabit congregational life together. I still think the center of the Christian life is a congregational life, right? And if you come back to church and you're like, this is a joke, do you know what I mean? Like, this is, we're, we're, this, is, this is so dumbed down and watered down and nobody's as smart here as they are at Trinity. And it's, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Because the church isn't a doctoral program. <laughs> There are wisdom, there's a kind of wisdom and know-how and understanding and formation that is carried in the practices of the people of God that are crucial for your formation to then be deputized as thinkers for the church. And um, when I was in grad school, I know for certain um, uh, the, the, what was so crucial for my sanity was, well, first of all, a wife who would tolerate nothing else. Um, but secondly, was actually our family's commitment to be part of a small group every Friday night where everybody brought all their kids and none of them were academics. And we would do Bible study together and I would hear the most ridiculous things in Bible study, but that wasn't the point. And the, my job wasn't to fix all the dumb readings of, of the New Testament. The point was to be in community with people who are trying to follow Jesus and love Jesus and are caring for my kids and for us and creating accountability. That was not an intellectual site, but it was a formative site. And um, I just think there's something about the intellectual life that makes us condescending towards that. But if we are condescending towards that, we will actually never become the kind of scholars who need to come with that orientation. So I think to talk about the integration of the disciplines or the integration of faith and scholarship is also a way of asking how we reintegrate the church and the academy. That's really in some ways what we're talking about. Without just creating some insular, isolated, subcultural rendition of the academy. Right? I'm not going to say more about that. Okay. So, in, in some ways, I think this is very much like the dynamics of Augustine's City of God. How do you be citizens of the heavenly city, but live amongst those who are citizens of the earthly city? Right? How do you be resident aliens? What does it look like to be faithfully inhabiting the rigors of the academy, while at the same time having an ultimate orientation in your calling 
that differs radically from many of those in the academy. It's not so unlike Daniel <laughs> in the Babylonian academy, right? Uh, I, I think that's, I'm not giving you any answers, I'm just trying to suggest new ways of framing the question. Why don't we, sorry, that took too long, but let's talk about it. 